forms of Inmarsat. Anyone know, anyone know what Inmarsat is? Inmarsat is, is the United Nations, um, I, guess, I guess they still own it, they, they still run it, but at, at one point they, they had all the communication satellites, they had all the video satellites. If you wanted to get a video signal from, from Vietnam to New York, you went through Inmarsat. They had it all. Now, of course, it's a much more competitive business and a commercial business. But Inmarsat is still in there. They're, they're still plugging away. And Inmarsat has this box. Not a big box. That'll put out a Wi-Fi signal for your area. And then beam and, and collect it, act as a hub, and then beam it up to the satellite. So if you really need to, and it's worth your money, and you have, 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 have a little bit of electricity, don't need a lot. You can get your email anywhere on Earth. Oil platform, Everest, wherever. We are massively, massively connected. And we're all carrying sensors. Okay? You think mobile office is a big deal? You think having a two-way pager is a big deal? We are all <coughs> carrying around sensors they're in, cell phones they're in, they're in our cars, they're in our houses. Most of us don't realize they're there. Most of us don't realize what they're doing. Some of them aren't doing very much. Uh, if anyone here uses um, uh, a diabetes uh, tester, a, a blood stick thing, uh, that's a sensor. That's a medical sensor. You, 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 you stick it, you put, put, the, put the drop of blood on the sensor, you put it in the machine, and the machine tells you your blood sugar. Absolutely a sensor. So but in, in the year 2014, one year alone, we added more than 300 new, new sensors to what every person on Earth is carrying around. And we saw that not every person on Earth is within the reach of the internet, and there's no point in having a sensor if it can't get to somewhere. So basically, we're talking about six or seven hundred new sensors for everyone in the reach of the internet. You all came in here wanting to know something about the singularity, either that or just serving a lunch in here that I didn't know about. <laughs> now, singularity, the term singularity, popularized by a guy named Ray Kurzweil. Ray Kurzweil, <coughs> author, futurist, an inventor. If you're into music, you may recognize him as a guy who invented some very, very hot synthesizers. And he has written you written a couple of books about singularity. And his idea is that humans, let me make sure I get this right, will transcend the limits of our biological bodies and brains. <coughs> and that future machines will be human even if they're not biological. Now think about that for a second. They'll be human but not necessarily biological. So that raises the such serious question of what, what's biology, what does it mean, and when is this going to happen? And you know, the idea of artificial intelligence and very smart artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence that can control stuff is hardly new, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But Ray put a date on it. Any consultant can, can sort of make, make grand claims. God knows I have. But Ray had the balls to put a date on it. And that date, 2045. Somebody tell me, what year are we in? What? 2015. Okay, how many years is it 2045? Okay. How many people expect to be alive in 30 years? <laughs> this is how it's going to be. <laughs> That's not virtual reality. That may be wearable technology. I thought I could have Anybody, by the way, anybody know who that is? Okay, this is a, this is a really popular picture. And, and no one remembers who this, who this is actually a picture of, and it's really interesting and important. That guy is a guy.
guy named Hugo Gernsback. Ah, now you know. Hugo Gernsback, for those of you who didn't go, oh. Hugo was a publisher. He was a great popularizer of radio. He, he, he published and edited something like 20 magazines about radio uh, in, in the early days of radio, in the, in the teens and 1920s, um, when radio had the same obvious, uh, obvious <coughs> guy, let's say, that uh, first computers did in the 80s. Okay? So, so he's massively important in the advancement and popularization of technology and radio technology. He also, oh by the way, started a magazine called Amazing Stories. Aha, uh -huh, here's the rest of you. Amazing Stories was the first science fiction magazine. Which is why the science fiction awards every year are called the Hugo Awards. That's Hugo. You probably hate that thing. By the way, for, for any of you who are really publishing geeks, um, Hugo lost all his magazines. They all went, they all went bankrupt. They were bought off by the name of Norm McFadden. Norm McFadden published a bunch of um, health and fitness magazines. But he helped invent, along with Bill Ziff, and, uh, and Hugo Gernsback, the, the whole idea of, of enthusiast magazines. So we're talking. And my point was, and I did have a point. The point was that wearable technology is not really as new as maybe we think it is. But it didn't look like this. Because I put the first start of wearable technology in 1887. Cardiac pacemaker. I won't ask how many people here are pacemakers. Look at it, you're probably more than a couple. <laughs> now, probably everyone knows someone who's a pacemaker, whether it's the first degree, second degree. The first pacemaker was in 1887. God only knows how it works. What's that horse is driving it? Or some sort of compressed gas driving it, but it certainly wasn't internal. 1950. A plug-in pacemaker with vacuum tubes. That's, that certainly wasn't internal either. Boy, you want to be careful walking around that room. <laughs> Don't want to kick out that plug. <laughs> but between the 50s and the 80s, you started to see, I'm sorry, the 50s, the, throughout the 1950s, you started to see transistors. Transistorized pacemaker failed after three hours. Lots of medical trial failed after three hours. That's why they're trials. 1960, first successful transistorized pacemaker. They used this, this, this really got me. Inductive charging. Inductive charging in 1960. We don't have inductive charging nailed down on our devices in 2015. But this is the, this is the start. Because it's one thing if you can put something in your body and you have to dig it out every five years to change the battery and how easy is that. <laughs> But even starting there, and I'm sorry, I have one the next line. Even when you start there, you charge this thing by putting something next to it and using induction. You don't need to take it out. Contemporary pacemakers, not only don't you need to take it out to charge it, you don't need to take it out to get the data out of it. Why do you want data? Well, wouldn't it be nice to see how often your pacemaker is firing? How often it needs to fire? What is doing in there? piece of technology that you can't see, you don't know how well the computer is doing, well, that's, uh, that's more a piece of faith. Then later versions use mercury and that should be lithium ion batteries. I'm not sure what the chemical symbol MI is, I don't think it's anything. And things start to get, you know, smaller, better, faster, cheaper, easier. And in 2013, you can now insert a pacemaker with a catheter, the same way that you can insert a heart stent with a catheter. <coughs> Makes life much easier, much lower impact. But the pacemaker is only the start. We're just talking about the heart. Because remember, there's artificial hearts too. Now, artificial hearts have been a much more complicated thing. Because once that's in, that's in. It took a long time. It took more
more than 30 years between, the, between having the first idea and actually getting something in 1982, the date that pretty much everyone here remembers. You'll remember the Jarvik 7 part and Barney Clark. And these, are, these are names you probably haven't heard and thought of since the computer festival started. That was real important because there was the, it was, it was the culmination of, well, robotic, implantable, wearable, cybernetic. But the funny thing is, that, that's not done science, not by any means. I mean, you, you do any reading about, about artificial hearts and implantable hearts, you see that, that the, the, the science of it is continuing, continuing at, at, at a rapid pace on a lot of different, uh, a lot of different roads. Um, one of the interesting ones is a vascular, vascular assistive device. Um, some of you may remember um, Vice President Cheney had uh, an artificial heart. That's a vascular assistive device. It's in there, and 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 this is this is great because the vascular assistive device, the VADs, use the human heart as the backup. <coughs> now think about think about the conceptual swap here. It's not the machine being the backup of the human heart. What's the main what's the main act here? The machine. If the machine fails. Well, then we'll then we'll do it. <laughs> Prosthetics. This is a magazine from 1998. See, that worked. Yeah, 1998. I edited this magazine. That's my cover. You notice batteries, computing, actuators, and servos. 1998. This was cutting edge. We put this on the cover because it was the top of science, it was the top of digital technology. Uh, we had some great pictures to go along with it. Uh, what was new here was that prosthetics could be powered. They could move more or less independently and under the control of the brain of the user. And that's called myoelectrics. Myoelectric arms and legs, they're brand new. 10 years now, they've, they've been there. Wearable technology, cybernetic, human, not necessarily biological. I should point out that, you know, we talk about electronic cats and portable DVDs and, 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 and robotics. We entirely missed the idea of other wearable technology. We we're still focused on on, on, uh, on cybernetics and all that, we uh, we missed it, but then you know, so did everyone else. So what we have, or what we need, what we're looking for, is computing power. The band would be good too. Technology is all about communication. You remember. So how much computing? How much? How much data do we use? How much did some look into this? And the numbers will blow your heads off. At the end of last year, December, the world transmitted two and a half exabytes of data in one month. An exabyte, 2.5 followed by 17 zeros. That's a big number. And what's, what's even more interesting than that is that that's up 66% from the year before. One year, 66% increase in the amount of data transmitted across wireless networks. Wireless networks. If you were to put that data on your files, your 100 gigabyte files, that you paid God knows what for, and that you squinted bullets to wait for, and get, and hook up, and watch, and use. It takes 79 years to send that much data across that, that connection, just so you know. Mobile data traffic. <coughs> was 30 times 
the size of the entire internet 15 years before, in one day. Wearable devices, well, we're starting to look sort of more normal here, with six tenths of a percent of total traffic, but still 15 petabytes. And you know that your wearable device does not send a lot of data. It sends a couple of bytes here and there. It doesn't stream. This is not, your, your, your wearable device is not doing full motion video live stream. Invite me back next year, I may change my mind about that. But right now, that's not what that is. That's little bits and, 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 and drips and grabs. That's, that's, that's my Fitbit. Six tenths of a percent of all total data traffic. We are communicating, and we are communicating using sensors. And we talked about before that there are more than 300 new sensors for every man, person, and child on the face of the earth just this year. What are they? Well, first of all, how big are they? Well, about a millimeter, millimeter square. I'm, I'm curious, how many people here are wearing a fitness tracker right now? You know, Fitbit, Nike Fuel Band, something like that. That's really interesting. I, I, don't, I don't thought that number was bigger. <coughs> but a sensor, you know, then I would have gone. <laughs> then, a one by one millimeter sensor can track your speed, it has an accelerometer, it has a compass, it has, uh, it, it can measure uh, your, your bearing and position, one by one. Six axis, eight axis. Uh, AMS has a sensor that's one by one millimeter. Uh, I think they're shipping it, if they're not shipping it now, they will be in the next couple of months. That can uh, sense color. Teeny tiny thing. Don't take much power. Don't, doesn't take much computing capacity. But this is what sensors are doing. It tells you location, your bearing, where you are, where you're going, whether you're lying down, whether